Next step, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the night. Uh, introduce yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. Really? Ah, oh, hey. hello. Good evening. Welcome. I'll tell you that was kind of for you guys. I hope you back up. So, hey, thanks for being here tonight. I appreciate the invite uh, that we received. And to, from the Sheriff's Office, our friends with the South Natural Fire Rescue, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. My, my name is Dave Walter, and I'm the Under Sheriff for the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Uh, the Sheriff asked me to do this this evening. He wasn't available, so I'm glad they accepted this opportunity. Real quick, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have had the pleasure of serving in law enforcement for over 40 years. And I do it because I love it. I truly do. And the Douglas County Sheriff's Office is a great organization, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. And I've had a great career with several different agencies. Um, and I'm, I'm here tonight, I'm going to talk about us tonight. But I just truly love law enforcement. And I will tell you, in this county, we are very, very fortunate to have some great law enforcement agencies, as well as a great fire organization in South Africa. So thanks for allowing me the opportunity to be here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Douglas County Sheriff's Office tonight. And, and as you can see here, uh, 1862 is when we started. 1862, Colorado became a state in 1876. Um, so we've been around even longer than that, which is amazing. So let's get into this. I've got 20 to 30 minutes or so. By all means, if you have questions. And by the way, my card, uh, my cards are back there. If you need a card, you can get that. If you need to contact me, but you'll be getting our information. So if you think about Douglas County way back in the day when we started, it truly was the Wild West. Early Douglas County, um, Indians and early settlers coming out here and started over by what is now Frank Town. And Mr. Russell right there, you've heard of Russell Bill, William Green Russell in 1858, Pam Gold over there on Cherry Creek and other settlers. And think about the land we have. Even if you've been in Douglas County for a long period of time, the growth from about 19, from the 70s, 1980 onward is just extraordinary. And think about what this place was like way back then. I happen to be a Colorado native. How many in here are Colorado names? We're few and far between, but I'm very proud of them. And I, you know, I was born in Cross Springs, worked in Grand Junction, and then Arvada, and I've been in law enforcement in the Denver area for over 40 years. We have changed a lot. We have changed a lot. And this is back in the old days. Early justice, they used to literally hang people from trees and, and guess for, for what crimes? Stealing horses. And that's the way it was back then. Now, we have a much different world now. Uh, much different issues right then, but at that, that period of time, when Douglas County became a county, that's the way it was. And as a matter of fact, it's tough to read, but that horse thief article on the left there, a gentleman um, found a guy hanging a tree, and the crime was being, he was a horse thief. And that's truly what happened. And they knew sometimes it was unoccupied or occupied, Hung in the edge of some of these areas, warning people that you better not come near the our horses because otherwise you're going to be wound up in a noose. And that's just the way the world was back then. That is just the way the world was back then. Douglas County Fish created by Territorial Legislature in 1861. And at the time, it's really interesting now, Colorado, as you probably know, has 64 counties. But at the time, it didn't have a lot of counties. Douglas County, ultimately, way back when, went all the way out to Kansas, all the way out to the border, and included a lot of different counties. And now I'll show you that in a moment, but it's approximately eight to 900 square miles now, and it used to be a lot larger than that. And I'll tell you about the boundaries of Douglas County, but created back in 1861. We've had about 32 sheriffs, 33 sheriffs right there. Right now, I'll show you a picture of the tail end of this. Your sheriff in this county is Tony Spurlock. Tony has been, what's really interesting about Sheriff Spurlock, he actually has been with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office for over 40 years. Imagine the growth and what he has seen over that career. He actually started as a dispatcher. 
and we're back on that day. Now, a little unknown fact, I wish he was here right now, that he and I have been friends for decades. By the way, I've only been with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office for about a year, but I, like I said, I've, uh, I've worked for two other large sheriff's offices, so I understand the sheriff business. I wish the sheriff was here right now, because what I will tell you is that Sheriff's Portlock and I have the same date of birth. Month, day, year. He was two hours older than I am. He was born in Tucker, and I was born in Colorado Springs, two hours apart. And one more amazing fun fact this is in this live show uh, our mothers have the same name. <laughs> Unbelievable. Thank God we didn't have So, okay, back to business. Sorry about that. Um, in 1864, James Frank. Frank right now. James Frank Gardner purchases and develops California Ranch just south of Frankstown, which had the first formal courthouse, of course, now that is Franktown. This area didn't develop. Franktown really was the start of this county as far as some, some sort of formal government. And right now, that is the map of Douglas County. Now, if you go in the statue, I always find this funny. If you go in the statue, they'll have descriptions of the county line. So if you look on the left side, you may or may not know that. On the left side of this map, the scraggly thing that goes from here down this way, that's the South Platte River, in case you didn't know that. That's the divided line between Douglas County and Jefferson County. So Douglas County is, think about this, how they describe it in the statute, beginning at the intersection of the center of the South Platte River with the first standard parallel south, this east on said parallel to the intersection of the eastern boundary of the west half of Range 65 West, then south on the eastern boundary. Wow. That's how they describe Douglas County. Here's our boundaries. The South Platte River there, of course, County Line Road, County Line between the Rapid and Douglas County in the north. On the east side, that is the center of a township. Townships are six mile by six mile areas, and that's actually down the center of a township. Uh, that's Delver Road, what would be Delver Road. Down to the bottom is the county line on the south of El Paso County, and then the flat. So that's Douglas County. It is roughly 30 miles along the south. In fact, I think it's not roughly, it is. But then on the bottom, it's about 36 miles east to west, and on the top, obviously, not, not, not quite as far. But it's roughly 900 square miles in total. So those are the current boundaries. The, and probably will be for a long, long, long time. 1890, Courthouse Castle Lock. Magnificent, $33,000 to build that. You know what that would cost now? <laughs> it would cost you as taxpayers a lot of money. We're not going to do it. Um, Gained political and social hub, Castle Lock, uh, incorporated with a population of 500 people. Back then, uh, Sheriff at the time, um, Cole Briscoe. It's kind of a cool name for Sheriff, Cole Briscoe. Law enforcement, 1900. Um, think about that. The county's only been around for a period of 39 years. Very few deputy sheriffs. Um, and there was nothing proactive that really occurred in law enforcement. Everything was just reactive. Now we have a lot of people. We have almost 600 employees. And a lot of those, not only do we do reactive patrol work, but we are also very proactive in a lot of different areas. So that was back in 1900. And think about 1900 <laughs> and prohibition. Um, Roy Mason took on the mob. The gentleman on the left, lower left, Diamond Jack Altieri, uh, his real name was Leland Brain. He was actually a guy out of Chicago, a guy out of Chicago that ran, ran with the mob out of Chicago. And in fact, he would come back and forth to Douglas County. He'd have big parties out by Sedalia on a ranch he had. But he was actually killed back in Chicago. And one of the, the reason I think he was killed, he was going to testify, testify um, at a trial, and I forgot the gentleman's name, but it was Al Capone's brother. So think about this connection with Chicago out here in Douglas County back in the time 100 years ago. So it's really fascinating, a huge history. By the way, does anybody know where Douglas County got its name? I think I'm right on this. Stephen R. Douglas. Stephen R. Douglas ran against President Abraham Lincoln in the 1860 election. <coughs> Douglas County got its name from Stephen R. Douglas. 
Some other famous stories, 1946, 17-year-old man who Fred shoots and kills Castle Rock Town Marshal, one of very few law enforcement officers in Douglas County being killed on the line of duty. At the B&B Cafe, a bullet hole still remains in the ceiling of the B&B. If you ever get out on the downtown Castle Rock. And then 1960, Adolf Coors III kidnapped. Adolf Coors III lived out in Turkey Creek in Jefferson County. On his way to work one day, a guy named Joseph Coors was waiting for him and ultimately kidnapped and killed Adolf Coors III. His body was found quite some time later, but Mr. Coors' body was found actually about 12 miles southwest of Sedalia, probably what is now Highways Road 67. But Adolf Coors III, his body was recovered outside of Sedalia. From the, I'm, I'm somewhat of a historian when it comes to law enforcement. Um, Adolf Coors, at the time when this happened in 1960, that was the largest search that the FBI, FBI had done since the days of the Lindbergh baby. And I think that was in 1932, maybe. So for a long period of time, the biggest man hunt in this country by the FBI. And I saw this photo on the right, you can't see it very well. The gentleman standing in the photo in the middle with the cowboy hat on, I am very convinced that that is Captain Harold Gray with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office in 1960. He later became the sheriff of Jefferson <coughs> County and served in that capacity for about 25 or six years. In fact, when I started at the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, that guy was my sheriff back in the day. So I saw the photo, I thought, wow, that is cool. Um, okay, okay, let's skip over it. Well, we've got a little bit more to cover. I don't want to stretch on time here. So let's get into a little bit more modern, modern day here. 1981, Inner Highlands Ranch, 40 years ago, that's very hard to believe. I, I remember when it started, in fact, I have a brother and sister law that I think bought new in Highlands Ranch back in the day, and they still have Highlands Ranch. Initially owned and planned by Mission Viejo Company, yes, the same as the California Mission Viejo, but bought and further developed by Shea Holmes as a master plan community in 1997. We were very fortunate at the Douglas County Sheriff's Office back in the spirit of that, they gave us land to put in a shooting range for law enforcement training. Maybe you're familiar with that. It's off 85, about four miles south of 47. And we are very, very fortunate to have that. It's a jewel when it comes to law enforcement training, especially in firearms. Um, and you might not know this, but about 60 agencies train there, about 2,500 cops do their firearms training at that facility. We are so lucky to have it. So we're very thankful that we, we managed to get that property about their development range. Tough to see, uh, that's population growth. And where it's very flat, that's 1960. And then you can see where it starts to come up. That's about, that's 1980, that's when Highlands Ranch started. Look at that explosive growth for about 15 years. And I think everybody in this room, if you've been around a while, I think you probably know that for maybe a decade or more, Douglas County was the fastest growing county in this nation for a long time. And there are roughly 3,067 counties in this nation. So huge population growth over a long period of time. And it's just, um, I spend a lot more time down here now, obviously working for the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, but when I worked for Jefferson County way back when, starting in the 80s, every time I come to Douglas County, I'm like, where did that development come from? Just like I do now when I go out on our state 76 past Brighton, and you just look, where did, where did this happen? What is happening here? It's just amazing our growth. But for years and years, Douglas County growing along with the Sheriff's Office. And Sheriff Spurlock and I reminisce a little bit because he, he was a Douglas County deputy back in the day, and I was a Jefferson County deputy back in the day. We probably ran into, into each other once in a while because I remember, if you know anything about Jefferson County, it's also about the same square mileage. It's larger in population. It's very long north to south, about 78 miles, but 16 miles east to west. But I remember on the graveyards, uh, midnight shift, Jefferson County, working between El Rancho, I-70, Evergreen, Conifer, and 
down in the Pike National Forest with two deputies on the radars. Uh, I'm telling you, if you're a cop and your cover cars in an armored way, you better work smart. But that's the way it was back then. That's what it was. And we're so different right now, but huge growth in this county. So right now, um, very interesting. Highland Ranches chose to stay unincorporated, and there are benefits to that. When you go by far, what it, what sales tax rate you pay? I'm sorry, you want to go over here? Okay. <laughs> but it's a lot lower than if you live in a municipality. And all you have to do, the services you receive from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office is as high a quality as you receive in the state. It's a great organization. I'm also biased towards Jefferson County and some other Colorado County. But I will tell you, we are very good at what we do, and the service we give our citizens is extraordinary. So we are very fortunate. We are also very fortunate when I say we, people in this room, that the crime rate in Douglas County and in Highlands Ranch, it is very low. It is very low. We are very, very lucky. And we intend to keep it that way. We intend to keep it. We like arresting bad guys. And I don't care if COVID or not, bad guys need to go to jail, folks. They commit crimes in your county. We want them out of here. So let's make that really clear. Uh, so, but Sheriff's Office and Police Departments are different. Right, and, they, and, and the, the biggest thing with a, the biggest difference between a municipality of like size is the fact that we run a jail. Now, the jail, I was talking to somebody before the program, the jail is not very sexy. You know, those patrol, fancy patrol cars you see out there, they're all painted nice and black, and have Douglas County Sheriff on those, and those, those folks have great equipment, the computers and the weaponry we have, and we need that. Um, but I'll tell you, work in the jail. It's a tough job. And cities, generally, there's exceptions. But cities, that's the huge difference, is we run the county jail. Okay. But we also have responsibility for patrol. We patrol, I'll get to that in a second, but we patrol for over 200,000 people in this county. But then we also have investigation services, our special teams. We have a regional SWAT team that's made up of the municipalities as well as the sheriff's office. We also have a mounted patrol. We have our SWAT team, which is the jail version of the SWAT team. Because, just in case you didn't know that, jail inmates can get rowdy on cooperative. Think about, in our jail, we've got 325 inmates, roughly. You know, we have 325 people that don't like to follow rules. And they don't like to follow rules in jails either. It's a tough place to work. But we also have that. We have hazmat, of course, our office of the emergency management, and the list goes on and on. Like I said, almost 600 employees and a lot of volunteers, and a lot of volunteers we have. So from a tax perspective, be, between property taxes and things like that, you do pay money to have the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. But it is much less than you would for police department. And let me give you, let me just drive on that point a little bit. One comparison of law enforcement agencies, and it's not a great comparison, but it's a number. Some agencies will compare officers per thousand with population. So in other words, a lawyer has a rule that a lawyer needs two officers per thousand of their residents. So if they have 380,000 people in there, hence 760 police officers. They, they're short now because people are leaving the war um, a lot. And one of the reasons is, I'll be honest with you again, one of the reasons they're leaving the war, we just hired a more officer two weeks ago, is they are not supported by their community. Now, when I wear a uniform in this county, when I walk into a Starbucks in this county, without fail, people will come up to me and say, I appreciate what you do. That's the difference, folks, because I think you appreciate what law enforcement does. I do. Now, do we make mistakes once in a while? The answer is yes. But we're going to be honest with mistakes, we're going to fix mistakes. But on occasion, we do err when we correct those things. Our, our folks are highly, highly trained. So Laura has two officers per thousand. We have just over one officer per thousand. So you're not paying, you're not paying for, of course we don't need two per thousand. Now could we use some additional staffing answers? Yes. But when it comes to our patrol, how we do a patrol, we just don't, we don't need two, two per thousand. And you shouldn't have to pay for two thousand, but not need it. Because if you have a city with no crime, 
no traffic accidents, no traffic issues, no quality of life issues, you wouldn't need any police officers. You wouldn't need any other insurance. But the reality is you need a police department because I, I always say this, that public safety is the most important thing government does. It is. Not biased. But I'm right. So, from us on the left, that's the Justice Center down in Castle Rock, the 4,000 Justice Way. That's where the Sheriff's Office is. That's where my office is. That's where we deploy about half of our patrol resources out of there. Um, our major investigations team is there, of course, dispatch and recruiting and training and hiring and all those other folks are on the left. And then in Highlands Ranch, built in 2011, that's our substation. And I believe you're going to be giving a tour of that in, in the next month or so. Next week. Okay, next week. Great. Okay. And if you have an opportunity, and maybe some of you have, and we've kind of put this off a little bit for the moment, um, I would ask you to come down and take a tour of the Sheriff's Office headquarters to include the jail. Because that is a whole different world, and it's interesting. Thank you. Um, we're not doing that right, right now because of COVID. Um, however, uh, is everybody tired of COVID? Yeah. Even easier. I'm tired of smoke, by the way. Too. Um, so right now, what does it look like now? Douglas County population is roughly 380,000 people. Estimated unincorporated county population estimates about 210. That number is important to us because that is the population that we serve, our patrol function serves in Douglas County. There's three municipalities, as you know, Low Tree, Parker, and Castle Rock. So the population of those cities, which have municipal law enforcement and police departments, they cover incorporated population. The sheriff's office is responsible for the unincorporated population of this county. To put that in perspective for you, Denver has the largest service population in the state of Colorado. Colorado Springs is second. Aurora is third. And between us, Jefferson, and Arapahoe counties, those three sheriff's offices serve roughly the same, about 210,000 people. City of Arvada is an example. It's about 115,000. So our patrol population is twice the size, almost twice the size of the city of Arvada. It's a big responsibility. It's big. And people don't realize that. But it is a big responsibility. 92% of the population lives in urban areas, which is 18% 8, of the land mass. 18% 8 of the population lives in rural, which is 92 percent or 82, excuse me. And our population is expected to increase by 39,000. Some of that will be in Parker, some of that will be in Castle Rock, some of that will be in Home Tree, and some of that will be unincorporated. So our service population will continue to grow as this county grows. And that will take more resources. Think about Sterling Ranch, you've probably heard of that, right? But what do they have, 1,500 homes now? I think they're going to have 12,000 at some point in the future. That's a huge all. So that's a little bit about us. That's about 20 or so minutes. Uh, so that's a little bit about the Douglas County Sheriff's Office and what we do and what we do for you guys. So I would love to answer any questions. That's something you always wanted to know, please. The, the question is, what do I think the biggest challenge of the sheriff's office is going to be? You know, at the end of the day, a couple of things I would answer. I won't say it's one, but technology is crazy fast, and for other people, the technology is going to be a challenge. Who knows what the future holds? If you remember, remember the first cell phones we ever had? We carried them with a strap. I like that. About three breaks, right? They, you can't believe the technology we have now is extraordinary. But I don't know where we're going to go. But that's one. But here's what's very interesting right now. I told you we have almost 600 employees. Our challenge right now is recruiting. Our challenge is recruiting. And why is that? Well, here's the, here's the reason, folks. Based upon the events of the last couple of years, movements or whatever, do you think law enforcement is attractive to go into law enforcement and meet as a traffic right now? Mm -hmm. Toughest job in America. Toughest job in America. So here's what we're sitting. When I applied way back when, back in the 80s, with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, 
I don't know this for sure, but I'll bet you there are 1,000 to 1,500 applicants for about 15 or 20 positions. Okay? There used to be a, what's called COPS, so we used to have a, um, a process that would select for many different agencies, and you'd have two or three or 4,000 applicants for maybe 100 positions. We don't see that now. We don't see that now. So, in a few reasons. With everything going on in this nation, and the, quite honestly, the lack of support for law enforcement in some areas, but not here, it's challenging to recruit right now. So we have to make sure that our salary, our benefits, the equipment that we give, the training that we give, is absolutely the best possible. And we've been very fortunate. We were not down a lot of deputies now, not like some other agencies are, because we are a good place to work. And we are competitive when it comes to the things I just talked about. So, um, I, if you look around here, look west, who would want to work in Douglas County? Right? And, and, you know, we get the benefit of a community that actually supports law enforcement. Three, two to three weeks ago, uh, there's this, he's not a young man, I'll, I'll talk about it right now, but he was here, I show him off here. This guy did four years with the Shreveport, Louisiana Police Department, and 12 years with Aurora, to include being a canine officer for several years. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he got tired of what was occurring for us. So I, we did a background on him, and you gotta be careful when you hire what we call battles from our agency, because you don't want problems. You want good people. And I personally met with this guy. We did a really thorough background on this guy. And I, I've been around a long time, I know people in every agency in the Missouri. And I checked on this guy, and all I heard about was how a great copy he is and how he did Aurora, serving the citizens of Aurora. We snagged him. We snagged him, right? I'm very proud of that. Very proud of that. We've got to keep doing that. We want other agencies best. We don't want their problem employees. And that's the challenge sometimes with battles. But right now, right now, I'll tell you, it's recruiting. Because we're all competing for the same fewer applicants than we did. So it's tough right now. It's very hard. But we're Okay. Yes. So it's on your slide that you have mounted police. Where do you utilize those? We are mounted. We have a mounted unit, and I think we have about um, ten horses and riders. Um, if you want to go to the Douglas County Fair and parade they had, you will see every one of them, to include the big flag. And that horse is gigantic. And Tom Brayford that rides that horse is six foot eight. Yeah. And even lies a fly stand. I wish you would have seen it. But most of the most of the mounted units is used in search and rescue type operations. A lot of Douglas County, about a third of the county is in Pike National Forest. And then we have lost hikers and lost folks up there. We work with Douglas County Search and Rescue, and that's that's when they would be deployed the most. Yeah, good question. Thank you. What other question? Yes, sir. Could you uh, tell us what maybe the top three types of calls are? Is there something that's trending we should know about? Uh, well, I'll tell you what's trending right now, and that's auto theft. Auto theft is going through the roof right now. And we've got a team of investigators that are plain clothes detectives that that's all they do is auto theft. Um, and a lot of times what we're seeing when we do special reports, I ask the patrol folks to make sure they include the arrestee's home address. And a lot of the arrestees we see on the auto theft are not younger. And if somebody wants to build a wall, I wish they'd build a fire line. <laughs> so we get we get a lot of crime from other places in here. In fact, the majority of our jail population is not Douglas County residents. They're from somewhere else that they did crimes here. Um, so trending right now, but let me add another one in that. Literally before I came here, I was out by the Ramsey's driving around, I went out on a call with some deputies and the sergeant. And uh, it was a, I don't know this for sure, but I think the person was homeless and he was causing a little bit of a ruckus and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with this, this young man. So we see a, a more of that transient population, I think, than we, than we ever have. However, um, the big trend, I will tell you, is, is all of this right now. Okay. What else? Yes. How much more time do I have? Probably just one or two more questions. About two more questions, sure. 
Uh, the Castle Rock has the North Police Department, correct? Correct. How does that work with the interface, areas of responsibility between the city police department like the Castle Rock had an issue in Douglas County Sheriff? Great question. I want to make sure you heard it. How do we how do we interface with the Castle Rock Police Department, I guess? So Castle Rock is surrounded by unincorporated Douglas County. So we we surround them just like uh, Parker actually goes up the county line, so it's around Parker, but we do surround Castle Rock. Castle Rock's a small radius. The town of Castle Rock is about a little larger than I thought. They've got about 75,000 residents, and they have about 80 police officers down there in Castle Rock. So, and very, and just so you know, very low crime rate. So, you know, but things do happen, right? So, we interface a lot with them. They have people on different task forces that we have, like our financial crimes task force. Um, they have detectives that are embedded in the Douglas County Sheriff's Office that work with us. Um, they also have membership on our county SWAT team. So we do a lot with Castle Rock. At the end of the day, they're what's most important though, our calls for service and patrol. So Castle Rock, if they have a major incident, they will let us know and by all means, we will assist them as necessary. Or if we have a major incident and they need to backfill some of our areas, they can do that. They have their own dispatch center and we can communicate with them and handle the calls and things like that. So, you know, what's really good in this county is the fact that we have three chiefs and a sheriff that really get along well and we work very well together and we do help each other out. So we interface very well with them. Okay, how about one more question? I'll take one more. Well, I might have to, excuse me, I have to take The question was, we have any trained dogs? Yes, we have six canines. Yes, and I will tell you, I'm not a, it's kind of funny on special teams. I consider special teams bomb squad folks, canine guys, and SWAT people, okay? So in my career, um, I was a SWAT guy for seven years in the Jefferson County, so I'm not, a, I'm not a dog guy, but I will tell you what, they are incredibly valuable. You know, people, um, if a canine officer stood over the door and say, come out and release the dog, and you hear that dog start barking, what would you do if you're a criminal? <laughs> you're going to go that way unless you want to get infected. Uh, but they're a great tool, but we're lucky to have six of them. Okay, how about one more? Yeah. Just wonder if there's a public liaison officer or anybody who pays attention to social media to maybe see another side of what people perceive as the problem, like catalytic converters getting cut off the bottom of cars. It sounds like, according to next door, it happens a lot. Uh, uh, porch pirates, uh, people roaming the streets, their, their nest cameras are picking up, people coming up trying their doors. There's, there seems to be a, an undercurrent of... Right, so we have a public information officer, Coach Hyden. We also have a community resources section, Deputy Brian McKnight is part of that. He's the guy that tries to educate the public on what's occurring out there and kind of what the trends are and attending homeowners meetings and trying to keep people more involved with them. So we try to do all of that. Okay, so lastly, one no more questions. Lastly, speaking of Brian McKnight, that's Brian, raise your hand, please. Okay. Deputy yeah, Brian McKnight, I had the pleasure to work with Brian when I was at the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office. And uh, Brian came down to Douglas County in about five? Three and a half. Three and a half. Oh, maybe time doesn't fly that fast. <laughs> Three and a half years ago, but he's in our community resources section. Every year, the Douglas County Sheriff's Office has what's called the Citizens Academy. We invite citizens to come in and spend time with us in the evenings and maybe some weekends to learn about what we do. Get a, you get an experience a little bit of patrol in the jail, SWAT team, SWAT team, K9, bomb squad, really just to teach our citizens about what you have in your sheriff's office. So, Brian, when is that? It starts mid September, goes okay. through mid October. Okay. It's every Tuesday and Thursday night from 6 to 9 and one Saturday at the right. right. All the information is right here on these handouts. Brian's got that back there, and if you have any level of interest in the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, or quite honestly, interest in law enforcement in general, please see Brian as well with your time, and really get to know us quite well, and we would appreciate it. We'd love to have a full group, so we'd appreciate if you're available. We know if you have to miss some class here and there, we understand that you're busy, but if you can, I would, I would love to see you do that, so 
Okay, well, I think, you know, it's really hard. Police and fire sometimes we like to jump at each other. And if you think I like turning this mic with a bunch of fire guys, it's <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn it over. But, okay, all right. Well, hey, you guys, thank you very much. Fire safety, disaster preparedness, injury prevention, and because he threw down under Sheriff Walsh, I threw down. I'm also one of the coordinators for the South Metro Fire Rescue Citizens Academy. Uh, we're, we're pretty good too. Unfortunately, ours is in the spring, so I'll be in the back. If you want to find out more about that later, after the presentation by my colleague Eric, you can come back and talk to me about it. And I would say it's a little bit more cool than the Sheriff's Office, but taken together, Douglas County Sheriff's Office and South Metro Fire Rescue were pretty much awesome. So, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. He's got a presentation for you. Talk to me later. Bye. Thanks, Eric. Well, thank you so much for having me, South Metro, here as well. It's a pleasure to see everyone, and I'm excited to tell you about South Metro Fire. For myself personally, I've been in the fire service uh, in Douglas County for 23 years, and 17 of those years are with Littleton slash South Metro Fire Rescue. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with Highlands Ranch, which I think most of you probably are, um, you were served by the Littleton Fire Rescue for a very long time, until just a couple years ago when, um, as a community, we got all of your support to vote in favor of Littleton and South Metro merging together. So I'm excited to tell you a part of that story. Um, before 1986, Highlands Ranch did not fall in a legal fire protection district. So that wasn't that uncommon in that era. Uh, there were seven different fire districts or fire departments that existed in what is today known as South Metro Fire and Rescue. So if there was a fire that occurred someplace in Highlands Ranch, Highlands Ranch would very much depend on, say, Lemire's or Littleton Fire Departments to send fire trucks down here to help take care of that problem. Um, emergency medical services are something that the community relies on very heavily as well. And going back to this era, uh, paramedics had really just appeared in Colorado around the late 1960s, early 1970s. And prior to that, if you didn't have a community doctor who could come to your emergency, you would have had to figure out a way to get to a doctor yourself. And where um, an, an interesting thing came about was the history of ambulances, and ambulances really developed from hearses. So when uh, funeral homes were uh, maybe looking to garnish some business, they would send their hearse, and those were the only vehicles really designed at the time to lay a person flat, and the, the hearse would transport the person to the hospital, and hey, if that took maybe just a little bit too long, then maybe the funeral home would benefit from, uh, from the sale of the casket. So emergency medical services weren't exactly ideal if you were a person who was having a medical problem. And um, firefighters were being called as community members to help out in these emergency medical incidents because their neighbors didn't want to have to wait for the hearse to arrive. So firefighters began learning first aid, uh, learned CPR when that came about, and really had a self-driven desire to be more medically trained to help their community members out. So emergency medical technician training came about, and then more advanced paramedic services came after that. 
And because firefighters had already been responding to these medical emergencies, EMS calls or emergency medical service calls started falling on the shoulders of the fire department. So that's really how we started to get involved more and more with these medical calls. <clears throat> So as we got into 1986, this is when a contract for service began for part-time firefighters from the city of Littleton to work in Highlands Ranch, most notably during the day during construction activities. And the very first fire truck was purchased, and it was that one guy that you see up there, which was a pickup truck with a little fire pump and water tank mounted on it. And there would be two firefighters who would staff it. One of those people was always a paramedic because EMS calls are more frequent than fire calls. <clears throat> and in speaking with the folks who would operate that vehicle, they said most commonly they would respond to grass fires, to natural gas emergencies like lines being cut by construction crews, uh, and then injured construction workers. But rarely, especially during the construction phase, did we have actual structural fires. So a small vehicle like that was sufficient until Littleton Fire could send fire trucks from, from further away. You may also notice an interesting color there. I don't know how many, maybe show of hands, how many remember the lime green, yellow colored fire trucks in Highlands Ranch? A couple folks here. So in the 1970s, uh, there was a transportation study done that said that fire vehicles or emergency vehicles in general would be easier for voters to see if they were this highlighted yellow color than if they were red during the day. So some fire departments bought onto that and started purchasing yellow fire trucks. And since Highlands Ranch was contracting with Littleton, and Littleton was purchasing yellow fire trucks at the time, that was why that truck was originally painted that color. So it looks a little bit different than the trucks that you see now. And it ended up being repainted red later on down the road because uh, the fire service is full of tradition and there's, there's only so long that we could all do it with yellow trucks. So we have to, go back to, we have to take pride in that. So that little guy is, is really how fire services started. And I don't know for sure if Highlands Ranch Metro District still had that truck, but a couple years ago I saw it out and about and doing some of the uh, open space mitigation out there. So the truck at least was still being used after all these years, last time I saw it. So when those firefighters would come to work, they were in this little trailer village, and that was a makeshift fire station during the day. We had security, the sheriff's office could be there, there was a clinic, and you can see an ambulance in the background. And that was an ambulance service company. It was one of several private ambulance companies that serves the Highlands Ranch area over the years. And this was before the fire department really got into the ambulance business of taking people to the hospital. So firefighters would provide the initial emergency medical care, and then they would wait for a private ambulance company to get on scene and either take that person to the hospital, or perhaps as this photo were to suggest, a really sick or injured person was brought to the clinic, and then Flight for Life came in to transport that person to the hospital in Denver. So uh, especially in this time in the 80s, Hospital care was a little bit further away than it is today, but we have such great facilities not only in Highlands Ranch, but certainly surrounding Highlands Ranch. So in 1987, uh, station, fire station number 17, which is the first fire station to be built in Highlands Ranch, was constructed. So that's the station by Highlands Ranch High School, right in uh, University of Wildcat Reserve Parkway. And at the time, Littleton Fire Department hired 10 additional staff members to help uh, boost the staffing numbers to be able to staff that fire station. So a crew of three firefighters were always on duty 24 hours a day, and a minimum of one of those individuals was always a paramedic, again, with a lot of focus on that emergency medical care. So at the time, uh, one fire station was sufficient based off of the call volume for the area, but certainly if there was a major emergency that occurred, they had to wait quite a while for additional help to get down here and help out. Um, so the, the trend for red fire engines, we can thank Highlands Ranch for going in the right direction on that one. Um, even before Littleton Fire Rescue went back to red, Highlands Ranch purchased this red fire engine and that I think got Littleton thinking red looked a lot better than yellow. So kind of one of those funny little things, but you can see the incredible size difference between that fire engine and, and the little yellow one that I showed you previously. 
And this fire engine was truly designed for structural fire cutting. It carried a lot more water, had the ability to pump over a thousand gallons of water per minute on things like house fires or building fires that occurred, and at the same time was able to meet the needs for emergency medical response. So the first really big structure fire that I've been able to find in the, in the Highlands Ranch archives was this one. And it was February of 1983, and that's the Bluffs Apartments that are at 600 West County Line Road. Um, thankfully, that fire occurred during the construction phase of that project, so there weren't any residents who were actually displaced, but there were a couple of firefighters who were injured in that fire, unfortunately. And that kind of just started the upward trend of structural fires happening in Highlands Ranch. And just like any community, um, the more homes we have, the more residents we have, uh, the, the greater the possibility that fires are going to occur. So South Metro responds to several residential, whether that's uh, single family or multi-family house fires every year in Highlands Ranch. Uh, the most recent one was just a couple hours ago, not, not far from here, right across the street from the post office at Quebec and Lincoln. Um, there was a house fire there, and uh, very well involved in fire. Almost the entire back of the home was involved when our, our crews arrived, and uh, happy to say that that fire was under control within 20 minutes of the 911 call. Nobody was hurt. None of the neighboring homes were damaged, and, and plenty of resources there to take care of that. But um, certainly one of the biggest reasons why we have a fire department here, obviously, is to keep all of these fires small. So in 1994 is when the second fire station for Adams Ranch opened, and this was a joint venture between the city of Littleton, an organization known as Littleton Fire Protection District, which covered unincorporated areas of Jefferson and Arapahoe County, and Highlands Ranch Metro District. So that was part of the original umbrella of Littleton Fire Rescue, was three different political and tax-based entities uh, and those three came together to make this fire station, which is right off of Santa Fe and 470. So we had station 17 on the east side of Highlands Ranch, and then 16 was built on the west side of Highlands Ranch to help with coverage. And uh, at the time, the fire truck that was put in service there was called a Telesport. So it is equipped with a 65-foot aerial ladder on the top. So that was the first ladder apparatus that Highlands Ranch had. And the benefit of that truck is that it can put an, a ladder 65 feet in the air to spray water from up above, and it can also be used for rescue situations. So if we have to put an injured person in a basket and lift them out of the space to get them uh, to safety, this truck is designed for that as well. So into the early 90s, call volume continued to increase, and the staffing model of just two fire stations, one on the east and one on the west in Highlands Ranch, just really wasn't that sufficient anymore. So while this map is a little hard to, to see, this was Littleton Fire Department at the time. You can see 17 on the lower right side of the map and 16 red and white uh, on, the, on the west side of Brown's Ranch. Those other fire stations further north just took a long time to get here, and that's if they were even available. So one of the challenges that we even have today is trying to figure out how many simultaneous calls are occurring in the same fire station area, and that helps us determine where we need more resources and helps us determine our staffing model. So you can see in this one, if 17 or 16 had something going on, and there was something happening in Highlands Ranch after that, it was going to take a long time, and we're hoping at that point that these resources further north all the way to Dry Creek or even Arapaho Road would be available to drive down here. So the decision was made to build fire station number 18, so that opened in 1998. And this was at a time when Littleton Fire Rescue uh, was doing more with emergency medical transport. So when this fire station opened, it had a fire engine and it had a medic in it. So there was a, a paramedic ambulance there as well as a paramedic fire engine that helped better serve the area. Um, this fire station today actually houses the ladder truck for Highlands Ranch because it's right on Broadway and just more of a centrally located access area for that specialized piece of equipment. And I'll, I'll get into some of the equipment more here as we go on. So the fire department medic units, as I said, you know, emergency medical care really started falling on the shoulders of firefighters because community members were calling their firefighter neighbors for help and it just evolved from there. So at least at South Metro and when Middleton Fire Rescue served here, our ambulances aren't just EMTs and paramedics, they are also firefighters, so they can do both jobs when they arrive on the scene of an emergency. 
Uh, the way that we typically run things is two of these medic units will respond to fire calls, and the first one that arrives on the scene, if they identify that no one is injured and no one needs medical care, those personnel will join the firefight, and the second ambulance that gets on the scene will be in a medical standby mode. So uh, those, those crew members, unlike many urban areas, like say Denver Paramedics or Falcon Ambulance that covers the city of Aurora, ours are doing everything from, from emergency medical services to firefighting. Wildland firefighting is also a major issue, and I'm sure uh, for those of you here, and we've been already talking about the smoke in the air that's coming from California, we definitely have smoke in the air from closer to home, including areas of Highlands Ranch. So in 2001, Milton Fire Rescue purchased the first wildland specialized vehicle for Highlands Ranch, and then just a couple years later, purchased a second one to help cover Highlands Ranch as well. And uh, that was because we could see the issue with wildland urban interface fires and the threat to the community. So a single house fire or apartment fire is bad enough because it can uh, damage the home that's involved and certainly threaten the ones next door. But when we start talking about wildland fires, we might be threatening an entire street, could be an entire neighborhood or an entire community that might need to be evacuated and homes threatened there. So that's a, that's a serious risk and, and one of the, the biggest ones that we're concerned about. And really, the wildland team for Littleton Fire Rescue got boosted up there in 2001. Firefighters were trained at national levels and deployed nationally to wildland fires all over. And in fact, our firefighters are still doing that today. And we've had firefighters in and out of uh, California, Montana, and Nevada so far this year. And that's a regular thing for us that, that will help other areas. So it was good timing in 2001 to make that plan because in 2003 is when the Cherokee Ranch Fire occurred. Does anybody remember the Cherokee Ranch Fire when that happened? There was a lot going on on the Colorado Front Range that day. A couple of major fires. One of them was up in Boulder and it was called the Overland Fire. So that had got a lot of attention and a lot of people in Southern Douglas County started to see smoke from Cherokee Ranch and, and confused it as perhaps a fire in Boulder County. But this one was a lot closer to home, so what's in now the backcountry wilderness area, not far from the law enforcement training facility, is where that fire started. It was on a red flag warning day, so that meant that the temperature was high, it was really windy, and the humidity was really low, which is a bad recipe for wildland fires. And that fire grew to over a thousand acres. Uh, thankfully, the way that the wind was blowing that day, it looked really, really dangerous from Highlands Ranch, but the homes that were threatened were in the Angeles Gate that day. Now, a wind shift would have easily threatened Highlands Ranch. So that fire became a pretty big wake-up call for Douglas County. More wildland resources and training and, and money was spent after that um, to boost the resources that are available to our community. The point of information about it, it was never on Cherokee Ranch. Correct. The fire was never on Cherokee Ranch, exactly. And um, a good point on that is how we name fires. And a lot of times it's named by the first person on the scene and, and what they saw. And in that case, the, the first unit pulled up the back driveway to Cherokee Ranch and said, I'll be Cherokee Ranch Command. And then it got named the Cherokee Ranch Fire. And from there, we created all kinds of confusion. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so in 2008, this, this was a busy 4th of July for us, and the fire department would put out lots of messaging about being careful with fireworks, of course. Um, that particular 4th of July was a dry one, and firefighters were very busy on Riggs Road, south of the, the homes where the, the line of homes is on uh, in Adams Ranch. There was a 17-acre wildland fire there, and that happened after your children driving in a car or shooting fireworks out the window. So they were, the fire crews were busy there containing that fire, and another fire was reported, also started by fireworks, in Northridge Park. And when that one started, because we had so many resources depleted and on the other side of Highlands Ranch, it was able to grow faster and bigger than what we would usually like. And by the time firefighters arrived, it was several acres, we had lots of homes threatened, and this house in the picture actually burned. So thankfully it wasn't a complete loss and, and crews were able to get there in time to save that one house, but there were dozens of homes spread in that day. So it doesn't necessarily take a big fire like the Cherokee Ranch fire to cause problems for us. 
Highlands Ranch is beautiful, it's full of greenways and open space, and those are good things, but they're also prone to have children go down there and start playing with fireworks or play with fire, and when that happens, it's easy for us to get homes threatened on either side of those open spaces, and that's exactly what happened that day. Um, fast forward to 2016, the Chatridge fire, who remembers that one? A few people. So that one was one of the biggest air shows that we've seen from a wildfire in Douglas County history. It was the first time that we had large air tankers used anywhere close to Highlands Ranch or on the front range to help contain that fire. So uh, much like the Cherokee Ranch fire, that one was also started by power lines that fell down on the ground and started to dry brush. So that one was a lot harder to predict um, and, and prevent. And that's why we have mitigation programs. So Einer, we met earlier today, he helps with a lot of that wildfire risk and mitigation. And there's a lot of different steps that can be taken to help us prepare the land around our homes, our neighborhoods, and our communities to make them more resilient against wildfire. He's got a bunch of information about that and would love to talk to you about it later if you'd like to learn more. So in 2019, January 1st, 2019, is when Littleton Fire Rescue officially became South Metro. And Littleton's history dates all the way back to 1890. So we're really proud to have that organization a part of South Metro's history. There's a lot of deep roots in Littleton and Highlands Ranch there. Um, but this was a great step forward in community service. The best service that we can possibly give was coming together as local agencies. And this was the seventh merger to occur uh, in the South Metro area to make South Metro what it is today over the years with all these different fire departments. And I'll show you a map here pretty quick about the resources that we have available. So the other really sad thing though that has happened, and this happened not long after the, the merger of the same school shooting, and this is the third school shooting that South Metro and Milton firefighters have responded to, the first being Columbine and then the Arapaho High School shooting. So, uh, a lot of our emergency responders were no stranger to this. In fact, a lot of the people who were at the STEM school shooting were at both of those other school shootings previously. And that's a big challenge for firefighters right now, is, is the state that we're in with violence. So our firefighters, as you can see in the pictures uh, behind me, they're equipped with ballistic vests and ballistic helmets. And we train regularly with our law enforcement partners to pair up firefighter EMTs and firefighter paramedics with armed law enforcement officers that will go into those active threat situations so that we can help people as soon as possible and try and save as many lives as possible. But uh, this is a very harsh and sad reality that uh, the evolution of firefighting and, and emergency medical services has gotten to, unfortunately. Back to the fire realm. So just last year, the Chatridge 2 fire. We're really creative with naming, aren't we? <laughs> so this one started pretty much exactly where the first Chatridge fire started, exactly the same way by a power line that dropped into the dry grass on a windy day and carried the fire. So this one was twice as big as the Chatridge fire. We didn't predict that when we named it. We didn't want it to grow this big, but uh, we're, we're happy to say that it didn't actually damage any homes this time, although it was very threatening and backcountry had to get under the evacuation order again. And uh, another very large response from our air resources to help contain this fire. So uh, it's something that perhaps we don't think about maybe enough until we start to see smoke in the air, but that wildland fire conversation is definitely a good one to have with fire so you know that if you're prepared as an individual if that evacuation order comes, maybe making sure that you don't get the evacuation order on your phones or your devices when they come and, then, and what to do after that. Uh, and then our brand new fire station. So the fourth fire station to be built on Highlands Ranch is station number 20, which I'm excited to hear that you're going to be getting to tour that next week. Uh, that fire station opened earlier this year, uh, right on Wildcat Reserve Parkway across from Mount Vista High School. And this just helps us better cover Highlands Ranch and the amount of emergencies that we're seeing. Uh, fire Station 17, the very first one built here in 1987, when it was built, it was kind of like a little house on the prairie. It was out here by itself and there wasn't much going on. And now it's one of our busiest fire stations in the district. So that's why we have to add more resources to, to be able to help you all when an emergency occurs. So the resources that we have available, I thought it would be kind of fun to take a look at all these different trucks. So in the upper left corner, Highlands Ranch has three fire engines that are immediately available and stationed around here. 
those engines, depending on the make and model of the year it was purchased, uh, they'll carry anywhere between 500 and 750 gallons of water on the track that they can use to fight fire before they have to tap into a fire hydrant. They're staffed with a minimum of three firefighters, but sometimes four. And the staffing goal of South Metro is to always have four firefighters on all of our trucks, uh, at least on all of our engines and ladder trucks. And they will respond to everything from car accidents and emergency medical calls. Everybody on that truck is at least an emergency medical technician to start that, that EMS care when they get on scene. But the trucks are capable of doing really just about everything, all kinds of firefighting out there. Moving over one, we've got one brush truck, so a small pickup truck chassis that's designed to go either off-road or drive a trail system in Haddon's Range to access grass fires and wildland fires quickly. To the right of that is what we call a brush engine, and it's kind of a cross between a fire engine and a brush truck. Again, we're so creative with name, aren't we? We call it a brush engine because it does both things. So that truck is, is designed for wildland urban interface firefighting. So those wildland fires we have, this could do the job of fighting a house fire, it can go off roads and fight the grass fire part of things. And this is actually the first up vehicle to deploy out of state for wildland fires. So it was actually in California for a couple weeks, but don't worry about that because we've got a spare one that will go to Station 20. So the firefighters still have a truck that's capable of fire, fighting fires here in case something happened back home. Uh, but that truck, brand new this year, has already been to California a couple times to help out with fires there. The bottom left corner, uh, one of our busiest assets are meta units, and there's three meta units that are stationed in Highlands Ranch, uh, with the ability to have a fourth at that brand new fire station if call volume rises to the level where we need a fourth. So we're constantly watching those call volume levels to determine if we need a fourth meta unit or not. Right now we don't, but it's possible that we could in the future. In the middle on the bottom is Tower 18. So that truck actually has a 100 foot area ladder on top of it and a big platform on the front that can carry four firefighters. They can hoist victims or rescue people from roofs or upper levels of buildings. And it also kind of acts like a rescue truck in the sense that it has vehicle extrication equipment and, and specialized equipment to help rescue people who might be trapped in or on or under things and get those rescue efforts started. So that one is in the middle of Highlands Ranch. And then the bottom right is one of our hazardous materials trucks. So this one was actually funded with a federal grant. And it supports South Metro's hazmat team. They'll respond to things like chemical spills or gas leaks, or if the worst ever happened and there was a chemical or biological or radiological attack somewhere in South Metro's district or along the front range, our hazardous materials technicians would respond with this vehicle to help people that are hurting in that event. Some of the other resources, we have a battalion chief, so a supervisor who is in charge of this geographic area. We also have a safety officer. That person is a lieutenant or a captain, and their job is mostly to keep our firefighters safe. So when our firefighters and paramedics arrive on scene of an emergency, a lot of times they're very task-saturated and focused on the firefighting effort or the rescue effort but there's not anybody that's really looking after their safety and seeing the big picture. So that's why South Metro has safety officers on duty every day to make sure that everything is going the right way and we're keeping our own people out of harm's way. On the upper right is uh, one of our dive rescue trucks. South Metro has two of those. This one is stationed at um, Firehouse 16 uh, near Santa Fe and 470. So the South Platte River and Chatfield State Park are two of its most common response areas, but occasionally we'll get dogs that will fall through the ice at some of the ponds in Highlands Ranch. Every fire engine and Tower 18 are, are staffed with firefighters who are trained in ice rescue and they have dry suits. So they can start that rescue operation, but the dive rescue truck is responding with rescue divers. So they actually have to do a subsurface water rescue, they have that ability. And then on the bottom left, we've got an off-road utility truck. So the trail system here in Highlands Ranch, especially in the backcountry wilderness area, can be pretty rough. And we'll have mountain bikers or hikers who get injured, some of the medical conditions back there, and our firefighters still have to get to them. So we've got the 4x4 pickup truck that helps, and then it actually tows a little ATV, and that ATV can transport an injured person on it as well. Um, so lots of different tools in our toolbox to handle the, the all-hazard emergency environment that, that we have here. 
So those resources fall into South Metro's big fire district. So South Metro protects 300 square miles, portions of Arapahoe, Douglas, and Jefferson County, and multiple cities within them. Uh, our population is roughly 540,000 residents in South Metro's district, and we cover this area with 30 fire stations. So resource-wise, we're the second biggest fire department in the state of Colorado, uh, sitting between Denver, number one, and Colorado Springs at number three. So a pretty big area, lots of different resources, lots of personnel available, and our dispatchers are fantastic, and they move these resources around kind of like pieces on a chessboard. Wherever strategically we need people, uh, our dispatchers will see that there's a vacancy of fire trucks or ambulances and move them wherever they're needed to be. So it's a very, very robust system, and uh, we, we couldn't be happier to be able to, to serve the Highland, citizens of Highlands Ranch with all of these resources available to you. Some of the things now into the future, that was part of the question here, uh, what we do. So the best thing that we can do is to prevent an emergency from happening, and that's why we have staff like I'm in the back of the room here for injury prevention, fire prevention, you name it. We try to do whatever we can to help you be as safe as possible uh, at home, where you work, and, and prevent emergencies from happening. And if an emergency does happen, we want to make sure that you're prepared to dial 911 and take whatever steps need to be done to help resolve that emergency while the fire department is responding. Um, we try and be the best that we can possibly be from an all-hazard perspective. You can kind of get a sense from those different fire trucks and pieces of apparatus that I described um, how vastly different the emergencies are that occur every day, and there's a lot of different ones. You can see statistically over here on the right, emergency medical service calls make up 65% of the calls that we respond to. So by far, most of what we're doing is medical related. Uh, from there, fires actually make up very little of that. Only 2% of the call volume is fires, but those are very newsworthy events usually usually big deal things that are destroying someone's property or there's, there's a wildland fire. So um, there's both sides of that. Um, public assist calls make up 16%. That's things like people who need help changing batteries on their smoke alarms. Maybe they've locked their kid or their, their dog in their car. Uh, maybe they call in maybe geese that are stuck in a storm drain. And really we respond to those calls not only because it's just the right thing to do because we're we're a part of the community and we want to help you all, but because it's also part of that risk reduction. We want to make sure if your smoke alarm goes off that you get batteries put in it so that it work tonight in case there's a fire. And when somebody calls in and says there's maybe geese in a storm drain, we're not animal control, but we know if we don't come and help out that somebody's going to probably go down in that storm drain and maybe find themselves in trouble. So we'd rather have our firefighters with the right tools and equipment for do that and make sure that it's safe. So, Public service or public assist calls vary widely, but the goal of that is still mostly just risk reduction. Uh, alarm calls are about 10% of what we do, and that number has dropped dramatically because we've got a great fire marshal's office to make sure that uh, all of our businesses are doing what, what they need to do to make sure their alarm systems are functioning properly. Um, so the bulk of those are fire alarms, but we also get carbon monoxide alarms that go off, and then medical alarms as well. So we have a medical alarm with fall detection or a pendant where you can trigger it uh, to ask for any ambulance to come. That's the, the type of calls that we respond to with those. And then the other is sort of just a catch-all. So a lot of those can be out of district responses where we help other agencies. Um, but it gives you a sense of the call volume and it was just shy of 40,000 calls in 2020. So a, a pretty busy fire department. Um, we always are using data and analytics to determine what happens next. Do we add more ambulances, more fire trucks? Do we need to move fire stations because maybe historically they weren't built in the right place? Um, those are things that we're constantly looking at. And then moving into the future, um, just maintaining what we have right now. So you have a, a fire district that's considered uh, an ISO class one, meaning we have the best fire insurance rate possible from the fire department. Um, from the standpoint of private insurance agencies. So if you tell your insurance agent that your fire department's ISO class one, and we've got a letter on our website to prove that we are, and we'll give you the lowest insurance rate possible, so that's a good thing. And we're an internationally accredited fire department, meaning it's a peer-reviewed system on all different levels of our service delivery, making sure that we're doing 
the best in class that we possibly can. So those are a lot of the things that we look at now and, and in the future. So with that, that's all I have for you, but I am happy to answer any questions you may have there. That was incredibly informative, so thank you. But one of the questions, and you had a picture there, you know, someone once said with all our interlocking old fences between our houses, is that a fire hazard? Could we have like a Chicago fire of fences catching on fire? I don't know. Uh, it, it can certainly happen where, where that is the case where fence lines can catch fire and carry fire. Um, however, wildfire mitigation plays a big part of that, so I think I'll let up here address what goes into that as well. Instead of my dog, I got to move over. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear my hand. Uh, for wildfire, that's definitely a, a wildfire sort of question. We partner with Highlands Ranch Metro District and their open space uh, folk to address wildfire uh, risks. Uh, instead of going into my usual 30 minute presentation on that right now, I'm just going to say we'll do that. Uh, something else you can do is sign up for a free. 20 to 30 minute home wildfire assessment. And either me or one of my colleagues, Selena, we come out to your property. Sorry, I didn't mail, I didn't offend you. Uh, we can come out and do a, 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 a walkthrough on your property. So we talk about the fence, talk about the vegetation outside of your, your yard, inside of your yard, structure, just good ways to make you all safer, as safe as possible. As you're building more fire stations, did you have to hire more people? And are you having problems like the police finding good people? So the question is, as we build more fire stations, do we have to hire more people? And yes, we do. Uh, generally, each one of those fire stations, if it's a minimum staffing level, will have to hire nine personnel, bare bones, to add to the staffing level to cover that. And South Metro's goal is to have all of our fire engines staffed with four firefighters. Right now, all of our ladder trucks are. There's six of those. And about six fire engines are always staffed with four people. But we have 23 fire engines, so working to that staffing level of four to be the most efficient that we can uh, is still a goal for us. So there are fire academies that are ongoing. Um, the next one will be next fall, and it'll probably be around 30 people that we'll hire. We are not seeing the same struggle in hiring the law enforcement kids. So, in, in fact, we've had several uh, law enforcement officers come to the fire service and start working for us in our last fire event. So, it's still a great way to help the community. Um, and, and so, a lot of the, the police officers are, are, are coming to this to, to do that. But we're, we're very thankful, especially in South Metro, we have personnel that we have hired um, from literally across the nation. It's a very desirable fire department to work at, and uh, I'm thankful that our reputation is, is as high as it is that firefighters from literally all points of the country, and even interested candidates from across the world are, are seeking South Metro's employer. Wow. Yes, I have two questions. One is piggybacking on what you just said. Um, you're talking about all of these stations 24-7. So are all of our fire stations 24-7? Yes, we have 30 fire stations and they're always in service 24 hours a day. And the other question I have is, uh, I presume that you have an active community information program regarding the schools or... <laughs> yes, so community relations is twofold. Um, Iyer is one of our risk reduction specialists and there's five risk reduction specialists who kind of tailor what they do geographically in the fire districts. And then we also have public information officers like myself um, who manage social media and push out a lot of the messaging that our risk reduction specialists have. And then we also do a lot to tell stories about our fire department and help the community better understand what we do. So we create videos to do that um, and we'll post those on our social media channels for, for people to know what's going on. Uh, breaking news in the community is also a big part of our job. So. Um, on, on Twitter is generally where we share right away when things are happening, like fires, and then we help get the message to our news media outlets on uh, things like evacuations or, or whatever breaking news information they need. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The, the picture of the water pump, where's that station? Which one? I'm sorry. The, the, you had the photograph of the four-inch water pump. Oh, the water bomber. 
Yeah, so our, 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 yeah, the question is where is that stationed? And it uh, changes every day, actually. So those, those resources, those heavy air tankers, are contracted through the U.S. Forest Service, and the U.S. Forest Service will control where they are based on severity in the country. So right now, the bulk of those are in the northwest of Northern California, Montana, Nevada, Idaho, those areas are seeing the most fire growth right now. Um, the state of Colorado contracts two smaller aircraft that look more like crop dusters, and they'll be stationed strategically around the state uh, as the state sees fit, depending on fire danger. And then Douglas County, more closer to home, will contract with a helicopter, and it's two different 90-day contracts, one that starts June 1st and then one that comes back in Brian, do you know is it October 1st? You know, I, I haven't heard for years, so I can't hear okay. what those dates are now. So we typically have an early summer and a, and a fall contract period, 90 days each, where there's a helicopter that's actually stationed right off of Titan Road, and it's a part of our initial response to wildland fires. So the County Office of Emergency Management funds that helicopter, and the contract can be extended depending on what the weather's doing. Uh, this year, because we've had so much recent rainfall, the contract was allowed to expire out of the first 90 days, and, and we're in that window right now where we don't have a dedicated helicopter, but it'll come back on here in just a few weeks as we start going into the fall, and, and that's where we see some of our wildfire risks. But the Douglas County Office of Emergency Management has contracts, basically they're called and needed, with all of these aviation resources. So we can either ask for the ones from the state, and or ask for the ones from the U.S. Forest Service. And it's basically on a first come, first serve priority basis. So uh, the Chat Ridge and the Chat Ridge 2 fire, for example, when uh, Douglas County picks up the phone and calls the Forest Service and says, we've got this fast moving fire, these are our weather conditions, and we have 800 homes immediately threatened, we get those resources really, really fast. But they have to balance that because there could be many fires occurring, and so it sort of depends on the day where those planes are and how fast we can get them. And you know, if, if a fire happened at seven o'clock at night, we may not be able to see those air tankers until the next day because of nightfall and wherever they might be flying from. So um, Colorado is working very hard to get more air resources. In fact, the Department of Fire Prevention and Control uh, just recently announced a new firehawk helicopter that will be available for the city. So uh, we keep bolstering those resources, which is a great thing, but it's hard to predict where and when exactly they'll be available. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so with the new uh, station planted over there, why is the driveway curved instead of going straight out of the wildcat? Yeah, so that's a good question. The, the site was moved uh, to this location. It was going to be up off of some of you. And when we moved it down to that location, there was an issue with uh, water drainage, as well as the infrastructure underground, and then the where, where that would have come out, my understanding is, they were concerned about the school intersection being the furthest east intersection, so they moved it down to the one where they felt like it would be easier to see the emergency responders come through, and ideally less pedestrian traffic from kids who would be exiting the middle school and high school are going straight into the neighborhood. The fire truck is exiting one intersection west of where most of that pedestrian traffic would be. So the idea being that uh, hopefully there's less kids or adults or dogs or you name it present when the fire engine leaves the station. And both of those traffic lights are actually controlled either with a button in the fire station that the firefighters can hit that will turn the wildcat reserve parkway red and allow the fire truck to exit. Or if they don't hit it, the vehicle is equipped with a system that's called an Opticom, and it will pick up its GPS location, and as it goes down the driveway, it will turn those lights red. And then anywhere else that that fire engine is facing, whether it's emergency lights on, if it has that system, the traffic lights will always turn green in the direction that the fire truck is traveling. So there's a couple different methods of traffic control there, but with the ultimate goal of everything is stopped from pedestrians and car traffic on Wildcat to allow the fire truck to move safely. 
Okay, you seem like it would take 10 or 15 seconds to get out the curved driveway versus if you just move the doors down to align with the stoplight. Yeah, it, it uh, certainly could add another couple seconds to that, to that response time versus a straight out. Um, and I, I can't give you an exact on that one, but I know that the folks that are way smarter than me when it comes to this engineering decided that that was the best way to go. Any other questions? I know. <laughs> no, we don't have Dalmatians. Yes, we still have some cats. The firefighters do take turns cooking. Yes. <laughs> Unless they're really bad at cooking. <laughs> and, and we've got some that are really good at cooking. So if that group can convince them to do it all the time, it's going to be bad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will have out, uh, both to our speakers and to the audience. And uh, please check out the tables in the back. And we will look forward to seeing you all here next month. Thank you very much. Thank you.